Hey, we're in week two of my imperfect family, FYI. You have a family. You've created a family. You are in a family. You want a family someday, and our families are imperfect. They, they have flaws. They have issues. Um, they have moms. They have dads, grandmas, and grandpas. They have everything in between, and they, they, things get complicated when it comes to family. And so we want to take four weeks to talk about family and the issues that we might have because now that we've acknowledged that we have issues, it's kind of like, okay, now what? What, what, what do I do now that I know that my family's messed up? Thanks for the information, Kyle. I could have told you that myself. And I want us to look at Luke chapter 15, and I want us to look at a moment that is a story, a family story, and might be from an angle that we've, you've not heard it before. If you've been around church for any length of time, you probably know the story of the prodigal son. Luke 15 has three stories in it, lost coin, lost sheep, lost son. And I want us to look at this lost son from a father's perspective, from a, from, from a family perspective, from, from a family unit perspective, and how we can leave here today as closer followers to Jesus, better parents, and maybe even better kids. Any kids in the room? You would like to be a, you know, maybe clean your room a little bit more? Maybe, maybe like make your mom and dad a good dinner, not just dinner that they don't want to eat. Like, let's be helpful. So if you have your Bible, Luke chapter 15, if you don't have your Bible, it'll be on the big screen behind me. Um, and uh, let's follow along and learn together. Luke 15 will be uh, verses 11 through 32. We'll skip around just a little bit. And Jesus, he opens it up with th th this moment with, 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 with this. He's, he says, to illustrate his point further, Jesus told them this story. Jesus often spoke in stories. They're called parables. And he says this, he says, a, 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 a man uh, a man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So this father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed up all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. He got after it. Had a little self, went, ran down to Vegas. And they say all things, you know, some stay in Vegas, so does your poverty, okay? So he spent all of his money and came back with nothing. And sometimes the decisions we make only make sense to us and we can't control others. And so I want, like, even if you're a parent in the room and you're kind of listening to this and managing what it's like to have kids and maybe you're a kid or you're thinking about kids one day and this message is going to lead you to celibacy and you're never going to have kids. Uh, that's not the goal. The, the, the goal is for us to be healthy. The goal is for us to be healthy. This is verse 17. Let's skip down to 17. He, the, the kid runs out of money. Shocker. He runs out of money. Verse 17, he says, When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, this is his prepared speech. Anybody ever apologize to dad? Anybody ever like go to mom and you're like, oh my gosh. And you get like a prepared speech. <clears throat> I would like to present to you a multitude of sins. I have sinned against you and the dog. Like, I don't know what to tell you. Like, just so you know, I, yeah. Okay. And so like, that's what he does. He prepares a speech. And he says this, Father, I've sinned against both you, uh, uh, bo uh, against both heaven and you. I'm no longer to be worried to be called your, uh, your son. You, you're parenting. You ever tell your kids to make up their punishment? And it's always like a million miles further than what you would do. They're like, you're like okay, you know, son, you need to pick your punishment for, you know, whatever you just did. And then all of a sudden they're like, um, yeah, I'll never play Xbox ever again. You're like, seems extreme. I was thinking like, I don't know, like the day. Here he's like, I'm no longer your child. Seems extreme. In verse 22, the father, but, but the father said to the servants, quick, bring your finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill, kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. For the son of mine was dead, and now he's returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. Yes. I, I, I want to teach a message today called this. Forgiving families throw the best parties. Yes. 
Forgiving families throw the best part. Families that are based and rooted in forgiveness throw the wildest and most honest and best parties because there's nothing hidden and lurking in the back room. There's nothing that the family's hiding. There's nothing that mom and dad's hiding. There's nothing that the kids are hiding because everything is open and out there for everybody to see and know. Forgiving families throw the best parties. Let's pray together as we learn together. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you that we have families no matter how great or messed up they really are. God, we ask that you would guide us and that you would lead us and we would look to you as the greatest father in the world, that we would give grace to fathers on earth and mothers on earth, that we would give grace to children and that we would have just a fantastic day. God, we ask for Geno Smith to throw touchdowns today and not interceptions in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Everyone said? Actually, I'm, I'm kind of okay if we just keep losing and get a better draft pick, but that's just me. Okay, okay, we'll go on. Hey, first thing I want to tell you this. First thing I want to tell you this. This is, this is new. First thing I want to tell you this. You've taken notes. Parents, parents make mistakes. I don't know. I, I don't know. Seems pretty wild to even think about or like work through. Like parents aren't perfect. Parents make mistakes. Parents lose their stuff sometimes. They fly off the handle Parents make mistakes. The father makes a mistake. The father makes a crucial error that I think is hurting and painting the world we even live in today. He lacked the ability to say, whoa, I didn't know you were allowed to cuss in church. That was a cuss word in some homes. No. No. He says this, Luke chapter 15, verse 12. The younger son told his father, told his father, whoo, you know you don't live in my house when all of a sudden you're telling me how we do things. You're, t- you're telling me now? Awesome. Let me tell you something. Go to your room. We can have a conversation later when dad's calmed down. I want, m- I want my share. See, what's crazy about people is we start off only thinking about ourselves. And so when we are so me-focused, we aren't we-focused. And so you would look at your father's money and think somehow it's your money. So that's called, it's this big word called entitlement. You may have seen this in the world and in your own children. What is wrong with our children sometimes? You're like looking at them like, did I created you? That must be some of your mother because that, that definitely come from my side. He said, the younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So the father agreed. We'll get to that. To divide his wealth between his sons. And if you know the story, both sons had issues. Both sons have issues because a father agreed to something that he never should have. Parenting is hard. And these kids are relentless. They don't stop. They will break you down. They they will say, can I have your phone? And can I have your watch? And can I have your car? And can I have this? And can I have this? And eventually, without you knowing it, you will have said, no, no, no. Yes, sure, leave me alone. Like, you can have whatever you want right now. Kids are relentless. And I remember being, okay, before I was a parent, which that's how I wrote it in my notes, but I'll be honest with you, I'm a judgy parent. Anybody, Anybody else? Before I was a parent and still as a parent, I'm a judgy parent. Like, like remember seeing kids in the grocery store and like that one kid's just freaking out and crying and, and yelling and I'm over there just, and like I'm unashamedly just watching. <laughs> because I grew up in a Hispanic house. We're built different. I, I complained to my mom one time. My side of my face is still red. Just, we, we were, it, it was just different. I, we weren't allowed to talk back. I remember I went to my friend's house one time, and he told his mom no, and I flinched. I was like, and, he, and, he, and she was cool with it. And I was like, so I went home and told my mom no. I can't hear out of this ear. Like, I, I'd see like a kid in the store yelling at mom, yelling at dad, and I'm like, watching the whole thing. And I remember being, before I had a kid, I was like, can you just get that kid to be quiet? Can you get that kid to stop? Can you get that kid? Now having kids, I know you can't really. 
Like, that's not a thing. Like, or like you hear a kid talk back. Like, parenting is exhausting. And you spend so much time with them that eventually you're going to give them what they want at times. Because there's no such thing as a perfect parent. There's no such thing as perfect kids. There's no such thing as perfect parents. And somehow we're trying to be perfect, but really we just need to do our best. We, we, we need to be focused on the main things that matter the most. We need to own our mistakes because you're going to make mistakes. But just because they're asking for, for it doesn't mean they get it. Parents. Just because they're asking for it doesn't mean they're going to get it. The value of your children hearing no and the value of you saying no. I see far too many parents in a peer relationship with their children that they are raising. Your children are not your peers. They are your children. They are not here to have a say. This is, this is not a democracy. We are not here to vote. We, this is a dictatorship, and we are here to fall under this regime. And it's called a mom and dad's relationship in leading because I know what's best because your brain's not fully formed yet. And as time goes, I will give you more responsibility when it is clear that you can handle more responsibility. See, no, you're not going to play video games. No, 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 you're not going to watch that show. No, you're not. But can we be honest? That becomes exhausting. So they will wear you down. We have to warn babysitters. <laughs> babysitters come over and say, hey, just so you know, these kids, they look cute, and they're nice, and they're respectful. This is what I call them. They are dirt bags. <laughs> and they will break you, they will, they will break you down. Because we come home, and like babysitters who get broken by them, our kids are like fully clothed in bed, and like the lights are on, and they're asleep. We're like, what? Like, yeah, they said they sleep with their lights on. I was like, in what? what how, how the house does that? Yeah, they sleep in their jeans. What, what, they don't even wear jeans anyway. It's like, why are they wearing jeans now? Like, what are you talking about? They, they said they always eat ice cream. But save your children a massive headache by telling them no. See, the biggest mistakes come when we give them freedoms they can't handle. The biggest mistakes come when we give them freedom they cannot handle. Look at, look, look, look at, this, look at this young guy. He gave him a wealth of inheritance, and he was not prepared to financially steward or manage something like that. So why would we think that he could all of a sudden? The biggest, like, we want to give our kids the best, and we have the best intentions, and then we get tired. We try to do the right thing, and then we get tired. I, I, I'm the youngest of three. My brother's uh, five years older than me. My sister's three years older than me. I remember my brother got his license, such a big deal, got his license. He wasn't allowed to have um, a, uh, anybody else in the car for six months and no radio for six months. No radio for six months. When my sister got her license, um, she wasn't allowed to have a, uh, anybody in the car for six months, but she could have a radio. When I got my license, parents of third, parents of third, when I got my license, I went to the drive-in movie theater that night with eight friends. <laughs> I came home at 2 a.m. Like, there's just, the third kid's just different. The, the third kid is just like, there's like, we're just whatever. Like, the first one, you like, you like clean the pacifier, the second one, you like put some water under it. The third one, you just put the pacifier right back in its mouth and say, good luck. <laughs> the first one, you like care about every, every time they burp or do anything, you're like this. The second one, you're like, good check. The third one, you're like, where is it? <laughs> because they just break you. It's just tiring. There's multiples. So what do you do when you mess up as a parent? What do you do when you lose your cool, when you scream, when you cuss, when you yell, when you spank too hard? Because okay, um, when you lie, when you under, over promise and under deliver, what do you do? There's nothing more humbling than getting on your child's level, getting on one knee, looking them in the eyes and saying, dad is sorry. There's nothing more galvanizing than when dad or mom gets on one knee and looks at their four-year-old, their six-year-old, their nine-year-old in the eye and says, Dad is sorry because Dad is not perfect. Parents will make mistakes, and your children will remember the response 
more than the mistake. Children, remember the response. Because we want to give our kids the best, best school, best opportunity, best shoes, best jeans, like what you can afford. But what if what you're giving them is actually hurting them? Our best intentions. We want them to be happy. See, if we want our children to be happy, we'll worship at the altar of their feet. We will worship our children more than we will worship our God. We will make our children our idols more than who he is. See, we need to worry less about today's happiness and more about tomorrow's readiness. We get so stuck in today's happiness. Well, they need this item. They need this thing. They want this thing. This will prepare them. They'll get in the right friend group. They'll get in the right sports teams. They'll get in the right education. They'll be able to get these things. They'll be accepted by everything else. No, no, no. I'm more concerned about their readiness for life than their happiness today. My goal is not their happiness. My care is their happiness, but my goals are not their happiness. My goals are their readiness to follow Jesus the rest of their lives. We commonly give our children things they don't earn. The grocery store freak out is followed by caving to give that child the item just so that they will be quiet. And what they are learning in that moment is when they react like this, the response is this. Participation awards are pointless. Where in a world is it valued that when you give a trophy to a child just for showing up, all it does is build an entitlement mindset? The baseline is showing up. Winners get trophies. All right, just me. No one should ever be rewarded just for showing up. That's the baseline expectation. One of the best things you could do for your children... One of the best things you could do for your kids is teaching them the, the value of learning how to earn it. Growing up, in order to get our license, I didn't grow up in a perfect home, but my home was pretty awesome. In order to get our license, we had to uh, learn how to drive a stick. So for young people in the room, that's where you, like, you shift. There's three pedals, not two. And uh, you had to change the oil with dad. Have you ever done anything with dad? That's a scary moment. Why you turn the bolt that way? I don't know. I felt like it was best. Like, why are you yelling at me? Why are you breathing? Stop. We had to change the oil and we had to change the tires in order to get our license. In order to get a car, we had to do this thing called, it's a big, it's a big one, we had to pay for it. <laughs> and if we couldn't afford it, there's this thing that happened. We didn't get one. <laughs> this is cr- It's crazy. My first car was $400, an 81 diesel rabbit. I sold it two years later for $800. That's called being a hustler. (laughs) In order to play video games in our house, you have to, you only get them on the weekends and you have to finish your chores. You have have to finish the things you do around our family. Our our son, just this last weekend, he he does, uh, we're, we're a part of two cults travel baseball, which we just started, and we're filling the waters. We don't like it. And we do, we do club soccer, so two Colts, pray for us. And, um, and, and so we're just in this little baseball world, and, and he's, he's got an old bat, so we wanted a new bat. And did you know they sell bats for $400? They're just giving them away. <laughs> There's nothing like watching $400 on, a, on, a, on an 11-year-old's shoulder as the third pitch goes by. You have $800 in your bag, and you got two hits on the weekend. <laughs> like, what are we doing? And so he wanted one, so we bought him a, this, we bought him a used one. <laughs> Baller on a budget. And we said, hey, bud, we're, we're great paying for your, your, your baseball. We're great paying for your soccer. We, we love you. We believe in you. This is for you, so you're going to earn this. And so you're, you're, you're going to, what, what would you like, this isn't the worst when parents do that, what would you like to do to earn this bat from mom and dad? What would, you, what would you like to do? He came up with a plan with a little bit of help and nudging and some tears, actually. And, like, it was a big moment for us. But, like, I want you to earn this. I don't want to give this to you because I want you to value it because I don't value it. 
I want you to know the importance of it. I want you to know what it costs. I want you to know what it takes. I want you to know, like, how are you going to earn this? Your, your children are never your peers. You are the parents. You are training them and guiding them. Like, I'm an American. I don't negotiate with terrorists or children. Yeah. Like, like, those are our values, and that's what we are. But parents, you will make mistakes from time to time. You will, you will say yes when you should have said no. You will blow up when you should have kept your cool. But your ability to get on their level and to apologize and see them eye to eye will be more valuable than allowing it just to like disappear because it doesn't disappear. It just ends up on a couch, counselor's couch someday. Yeah. Second thing is this, kids make mistakes. All the kids are like, that's garbage. This guy's terrible. They're foolish. <laughs> Have you ever, say, you, ever say, you ever say this line? What are you thinking? <laughs> Multiple times a day I look at my kids and say that. What, what was your plan? Do you ever say that one? What was, your, what, was your, what, what was your plan? Our kids look at us like, what's a plan? <laughs> we say this one all the time. Why would you do that? As if they're like, well, what I was thinking, there's no plan. Kids make mistakes. They are foolish. But so were you. Luke 15, verse 13. A few days later, this young man packed up all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. It's interesting how we are massively, as parents, we are massively overprotective in some, some ways and overly naive in others massively over, you cannot cross the street. Can't cross the street without somebody. You can't, can't go to a friend's house. You got to be protective. Da, da. But hey, here's your 13. Here's a cell phone. Hey, you're 13. Here's an unlocked iPhone. Go ahead. Look at anything. Hope you don't get addicted to porn. Hope no one sexed you. Hope you don't end up with just the wildest things. Good, good luck, buddy. Uh, hey, I, I hope you don't struggle with FOMO as, as you're like endlessly scrolling. I, I hope you don't get, like, just wildly just get ruined by, by, by comparison as you just watch TikToks and, and Instagrams over and over and over again about what other kids in your athletic, uh, in, in your age group, in, in your uh, uh, musical abilities are doing. They're so far more advanced than you. You're not going to, hey, good luck, bud. But hey, don't cross the street alone. And our goal as parents is this. Kids will make mistakes, but how do we guide them? We've got to gradually transfer dependence from us onto God. There's a process that you go on with your children in a coaching and mentoring and parenting journey, getting them ready to be an 18-year-old, to leave the house, to go to college, to go to community college, to go to trade school, to go work at Chick-fil-A, whatever they're going to do. May we transfer that dependence on their life going from us onto God. May we guide them and lead them. See, when you give a, God, uh, when you give a kid a good foundation, they will always come back home, even with their tails between their legs. Just give kids good foundations. Don't give them perfect homes. Don't give them perfect parents. Don't give them perfect perspectives of life and everything they can do. Do the best you can, but have the foundation always be in Christ. Have the foundation always be in the church. There's three goals in our home of parenting. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5. When our children leave, we want this. And they must love the Lord their God with all of their heart, with all of their soul, and with all of their strength. I want them to leave with the foundation that their relationship with God is their own. I want them to leave with the foundation that God loves them no matter the mistakes they will make. I want them to leave our home knowing that God loves them and believes in them, that there's a home that will always care for them no matter the sin, no matter the mistake, no matter the journey they will walk on. There is always a place called home. But you got to leave our house, our goal in those 18 years is to prepare them for Deuteronomy, is to prepare them for that moment to love God with all of their soul, with all their mind, and with all of their strength. It doesn't mean they're going to be perfect kids. It doesn't mean they're going to go off and go to college or go to trade school or go do whatever they're going to do and be perfect. It means that there's a foundation. It means there's hope for their life. There's intentionality. So when we send them from our home, I want them to have that foundation, not just part of God. I don't want them to have a convenient relationship with God and go to church when it's convenient. 
I want it to be all of them, all of their heart, all of their soul, all of their strength. And how can you help your kids do this? It would be by raising the bar. Raise the bar of your parenting. Raise the bar that church is not an option, it's who we are. My, growing up in our home, I remember my best friend skipped church. I saw him at school the next day. I said, hey, you didn't, I didn't see you at church yesterday. He goes, yeah, you know, I told, I told my parents I didn't want to go. So the next weekend, came around to church time. I was like, hey, mom, I don't want to go. I can't hear out of this year. I don't even know if she responded. I think she just looked at me and we were just like, okay, we're going. Jeez, please. <laughs> but what built in my life is a rhythm because the first weekend that I left my house and moved to college, the first thing I did was I looked for a church. First thing I, first thing I looked for was what I knew was a normal rhythm in my life. I, I looked for a safe place. I looked for the thing that mattered most. I looked for the, you know what, my freshman year, I was not an angel. We saw some things. But I went to church every weekend. I found a community that loved me. I found a community that believed in me. I started serving the place. Raise the bar. We go to church, we tithe. We talk to our kids that we tithe. We don't just tithe and they don't know that it's happening. They're a part of our family. They're not absent from the things our family does financially. They know that when they get gifts, they know that when they get paid, they know that when they do, they tithe as well. It's something our family does, not something that Kara and I do. Raise the bar. We serve. Like, what are areas of your parenting that you just practically need to raise the bar? I, I remember... Um, I remember growing up, I, uh, I got my license, and, and I, I was going on a date, taking a girl out, and I was so excited. My parents, it was like a Friday night or Saturday night. My parents were like, what are you doing? I was like, oh, I'm going on a date, and they were like, who are you going with? And I was like, dang it, this is going to suck. <laughs> and, uh, and I go, oh, I'm going, I'm going to, I'm taking so-and-so out, and, and they go, oh, that's great. Um, my, my dad goes, or my mom goes, does she love the Lord? Well, like, we're hoping maybe, like, someday it's like a missions trip. <laughs> like, we're, I'm a missionary. I'm just out on this mission field right now. And, and you know, if you could financially support my GoFundMe, um, it'd be great. And my, I remember telling my parents, no, that she didn't follow the Lord. And my dad goes, wow, that sounds like that decision lacks wisdom. <laughs> went, cool. So really pumped for this date now. <laughs> Gosh, I can't wait to get the jack-in-the-box with her. Yeah. When my dad reminded me in that moment, because this is how our parents raised us, my dad goes, remember, beach kids make best decisions. Poor, good, better, best. Do you feel like this is the best decision? You know what I answered that day? <laughs> I think you know. So yes, yeah, seems best to me. <laughs> seems pretty great. <laughs> and, uh, we went on a date. She didn't get saved um, then. <laughs> <laughs> so just praying for her journey. And, uh, but they let me make a bad decision. Because beaches make best decisions. See, at 17, 18 years old, I had the equity and the ability for my parents to begin to release me so that I could make best decisions and poor decisions all at the same time. But it ultimately, they were my decisions. And ultimately, I did not date this girl. Ultimately, I walked away from that opportunity of a relationship because I knew that my parents were leading me to make best decisions. That ultimately, tr um, power had been transferred to me, but guidance was still there. Kids will make mistakes. If you don't expect much from your kids, you won't get much from your kids. If you believe they are capable of more, they will be capable of more. Third and final thing is this. It's better to be, a forgive, uh, it's better to be forgiving than to be right. It's better to be forgiving than to be right. 
I know plenty of times in my parenting where I've chosen pride over forgiveness. When I've hurt my kids, when I've yelled at them, when I've been frustrated with them, when I've blown up at them, when I've overpromised and underdelivered to them, and I've allowed it to go disappear rather than to engage it and say, Dad, sorry. And I love that this son sees his issue, sees his issue, but he knows that he's got a good dad. Luke chapter 15, verse 20, so he returned home to his father, and while he was still long off, his father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son. He embraced him, and he kissed him. His son said, Father, remember he's got a prepared speech, said, Father, I have sinned against both you, both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. I love that his dad interrupts him mid-sentence. He silences his, his, his confession. I want my kids to know that when they sin, when they disappoint, when they, they always know that there's a home that they come running to. They don't need to come with a formed confession. That They're coming into the arms and the embrace of a father who loves them no matter what. That's the foundation that we are building, that we want. He doesn't even let him finish his prepared speech. This is probably the one thing you wish you got growing up, though, too. I think you can even think about your own childhood. You wish that you had a home that you could have run back to, to a father's arms, to a mother's arms. But ultimately, what you had to do was go to isolation. You had to hide because you know the disappointment and the anger that you would have faced. Well, just because you got that doesn't mean your children have to have that. This is the one thing our children need. Grace when they act like fools. It doesn't mean you accept their foolish behavior and it doesn't mean you are not honest. It doesn't mean you don't set up boundaries and parameters of your home if it gets that bad. But it means that they know no matter what, there's a foundation of a home of a mother and a father who will love them no matter what. Will embrace them back for a meal to care for their needs. Because if we don't give grace, they will assume perfection is the standard. If we don't give grace as parents, we will, we will create children who assume perfection is the standard. Luke 15, 22, after he interrupts his son, he says, but, I tell you every week, but's in the Bible. But his father said to the servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house, put it on him, get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. Jesus looks at you through the lens of forgiveness. So why wouldn't we look at our children through the lens of forgiveness? Jesus is not part of our lives. Jesus is at the center of our lives. Forgiveness is not something that we do. It is who we are. Forgiveness is at the center of who Jesus is. Forgiveness is at the center of our homes. Families need the healing power of Jesus. I wonder if our kids will ever follow Jesus. If you don't ever show them the power of forgiveness. They'll just hear about a forgiving God and a forgiving father, but never see a forgiving father in their home. That's why we come to a place like this, to a house of hope, to the local church, to worship, to hear, to be encouraged, but to know that even though you are not a perfect parent, and even as you are single and won't be a perfect parent someday, even as you are a child and you will make foolish decisions or your children will make foolish decisions, there is always grace on our lives. 
There is always grace of a Father who loves us. And many of us need to bring our parenting to the Father. Many of us need to bring our, our, our children to the Father and l- spend less time complaining about their absent behavior and start praying for a heavenly behavior. Start praying for their future spouse. Start praying for their character. Start praying for their integrity and start making some changes. Like even things we talked about last week and this week, I would rather lead a home that that has a moment of voluntary forgiveness than to be absent from that grace. We've given things to our children. We've given them extended opportunities that they don't deserve or can't manage or is too far advanced for them, pull it back, say you're sorry, and move forward. 